Rio Grande del Norte National Monument features the deepest canyon in New Mexico at its Wild Rivers Recreation Area. The Rio Grande River carved this gorge into the Taos Plateau, a dry plain dotted with extinct volcanoes. The plateau forms the floor of the Rio Grande Rift Valley, flanked by mountain ranges both east and west. Like the East African Rift Valley, famous as the home of early humans, the rift is a place where the Earth's crust is pulling apart. Join Rock On Mother Earth for a hike into the gorge with two rangers and an interview with the lead author of a recent study of its geology. I'm roadside geology of Georgia co-author and walks and talks guy Bill Witherspoon. Welcome to Rock On Mother Earth. We get the beat of the planet from her landscapes and rocks. Episode 2, Wild Rivers, the Power of Water. Tim Long is an interpretive ranger at the Bureau of Land Management's Rio Grande del Norte National Monument. We began our visit one October morning at the Wild Rivers Visitor Center. I was startled at the outset when Ranger Long mentioned one of his other two occupations. Only a couple of hours before, Rock on Mother Earth's Beat of the Planet tagline had occurred to me. Tim was introducing some words he had written to explain the Rio Grande Rift to visitors. I use music taglines a lot. I'm a musician. I majored in music in college, and I was yeah. a, a music educator. What's, what kind of music do you... I, kind of I'm a drummer, a percussionist, so I do anything from uh, classical work to rock and roll. I don't do much playing now. I'm working here. Um, I use the little tagline that something's got to give, okay. uh, which is a you know, Cole Porter tune. This dates me, I think, but uh, it's a wonderful tune. How can the geologic process stretch hard rock such as granite? Uh, think of the Earth's, Earth's rock crust under the Rio Grande Rift as being 18 miles deep. Mm. 12 miles below the Earth's surface, rocks are hot enough to stretch like toffee. Top six miles of rock in the rift is cold and brittle and breaks into large blocks. The geometry or shape of these fault blocks are amazingly controlled by the physics of gravity and heat of the stretching rocks. Very good. So That's something's got to yeah. give, yeah. you know? Yeah. Wild Rivers is an easy 20-minute drive from Cuesta, New Mexico. Along the two-hour drive to Cuesta from Santa Fe, is the other unit of the National Monument, Orilla Verde. You pass its visitor center in the Rio Grande Gorge just before the road climbs up to the Taos Plateau. The Taos Plateau is blanketed with lava flows and dotted with volcanoes a lot like the high plains around Capulin Volcano. But it's literally in the shadow of the Sangre de Cristo Range. Only 17 miles southeast of the Wild Rivers Visitor Center, Wheeler Peak soars to more than 13,000 feet. The youngest volcano here is a lot older than Capulin. The last eruption was nearly 3 million years ago. In a third occupation, Ranger Long and his wife Connie own North Star Toys. They have been handcrafting wooden animals and wheeled playthings since 1979. Tim's model of a rift valley may be one of the simpler items he has fashioned. He followed a design that Dr. Richard Chamberlain of New Mexico Tech published in 2012. Imagine a woodblock the size and shape of a large dictionary. Picture it standing vertically. Where the front cover of the dictionary would be, you see three cuts that converge to make the letter Y. Two cuts from the top edge slant together to create a wedge pointing down. One vertical cut from the bottom rises to meet them. As Tim pulls the end pieces apart, the middle wedge, a triangle in profile, drops down to represent the rift valley. What we have here is um, some blocks of wood with some rubber bands and a little pulling mechanism so that when I pull the rubber bands, the middle block, which is a triangle, is going to drop down, showing what happens during the creation of the rift. So we have now this uplift happening, particularly on the east side, so that this Sangre de Cristo mountains are getting created. And on the west side, the uplift is a bit weaker, but it's happening and we have what's called the Tusas Mountains being formed on the west side. And in the middle, that middle triangle 
which is kind of suspended now just drops down. So roughly 30 million years ago, when the rift has taken place, there's also watershed activity happening from these newly created mountains. The Sangre de Cristos and the Tusas Mountains that are flowing with water. So we have sediment and, you know, all of the rock and so on. Once all of this pulling apart takes place, the magma is kind of working its way up through the mantle and into the crust of the earth between the rock spaces and so on. And as those vents make their way up to the surface, we get volcanic activity happening, which happened about five million years ago. Uh, and the last bit was about three million years ago on the uh, Ute Mountain Lava Dome that is our most prominent uh, and the most recent of the volcanic activity. And so once the volcanic activity happens, you have different flows occurring. We call this type of flow serviette of basalt, and it's flowing at different times. So we have sediment happening. We have volcanic activity happening. They created what we now call the Taos Plateau. At the visitor center looking west, you really are basically seeing part of the 150 mile long Taos Plateau. But you're also seeing dome type mountains, which are extinct volcanoes. Hunters and hikers frequent these mountain areas. And what we're seeing is Montoso Mountain, Cerro de Hoyo, which means Pot Mountain, and Chiflo Mountain. All these are the result of volcanic activity. I went to stand on the Servietta Basalt at the Pay Station viewpoint about two and a half miles north of the visitor center. Across the gorge, I could see the three Taos Plateau volcanoes that Ranger Long just mentioned. In the west wall of the gorge, I could even pick out a feature from the early history of the Rio Grande Rift. For best lighting, you want to go in the morning. Park at the Wild River's entrance sign and walk to the northwest. A 2017 U.S. Geological Survey field trip guide by Wren Thompson and others wrote the following about this stop, which you should heed. Please note the blocks with potentially dangerous fractures at the gorge rim. Carefully proceed across the fractures at the narrowest point that requires no more than a wide step to safely reach the gorge rim for the best view of gorge stratigraphy. Do not attempt this if you are physically impaired or are fearful of heights. I can add that the features in the Servietta basalt seen here can also be viewed from behind a guardrail at the Chawaluna Overlook. The topography above the rim across the gorge is also visible from the Big Arsenic Trail, as mentioned later in this podcast. Only the view of the buried fault block and the opposite canyon wall is unique to this location. At the pay station viewpoint, you are standing atop the upper Servietta basalt, which caps the rim on both sides of the gorge. There was no gorge 3.7 million years ago when Servietta lava flowed over the Taos Plateau from volcanoes somewhere to the southwest. This remained true for more than 3 million years. Any basalt you find in the gorge today, even blocks the size of boxcars, had been solid rock for a long time before it slid into the gorge. The surface of the basalt is broken into roughly hexagonal columns, each large enough to stand on. The cracks that separate them are called columnar joints. They often result from contraction of rock as thick lava flows cool. They make the scenery of at least two other national monuments. One, Devil's Tower, Wyoming, became famous from the Steven Spielberg movie about space aliens, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The other, on the east side of the Sierra Nevada, is Devil's Postpile, California. I'm not sure why people naming these places were thinking the same thing. The cracks you cross on the way to the cliff edge are themselves future cliff edges. They follow the weakness of the columnar joints. When you look over the edge, you will see the top of a pile of jagged rock. This came from previous cliff edges that gave way to gravity. You will hear more later in the podcast about the piles of rock pieces called talus piles. Looking across the gorge, all the hills and mountains resulted from volcanic activity. According to the 2017 Thompson and Others Field Trip Guide, their rock ages range from 25 to 3.7 million years old. 
Let me take you through all six summits beginning on your right. The bumpy looking mountain far to the right is Cerro Chiflo, about 10 million years old. To the left of it, the smoother broad dome is Cerro de la Hoya or Pot Mountain, 4.3 million years old. A similar looking large mountain to your left is 5 million year old Cerro Montoso. Just right of Cerro Montoso in the far distance is a little pointed summit, which is Cerro del Aire. At 3.7 million, it's about the same age as the upper Servietta basalt. The oldest rocks at 25 million years old are in the near hills directly across the gorge, just to the right of Cerro del Aire. The hills are known as timber and brushy mountains. If you look closely at the base of the prominent upper Servietta basalt cliffs just to the left of timber and brushy mountains, you will see a thin band of pinkish loose material. Most likely, if all the talus could magically disappear from the walls of the gorge, sediments like these would appear nearly everywhere between and below the upper and lower Servietta basalt layers. But the reason for standing at this viewpoint is the exception that juts out of the talus directly across the gorge. It is a triangular patch of reddish rock nearly a thousand feet long at the base and nearly 400 feet high. Notice that the lower Servietta basalt cliffs to the right of it end against its slope. This suggests it was a peak on the landscape that was present when that basalt flowed over the plateau. Geologists conclude that it came from the same volcanic activity 25 million years ago that made the rock of timber and brushy mountains. I was puzzled to learn that any 25 million year old rock is visible in and above the gorge. Think back to Ranger Long's model and its down-dropped middle block. The first volcanics laid down on the Rift Valley floor ought to be deeply buried under later sediments and volcanics. But it turns out that in detail there are high and low fault blocks within the Rift Valley. One of the faults that separated two blocks has left evidence that you can see here. If you look closely at the left side of the exposed old rocks, you will see parallel bands that slope to the left at about 70 degrees. These are layers of volcanic rock that were nearly horizontal when deposited. They must have been tilted before the lower Servietta basalt flowed into the area. Movement on a fault is the most likely process to have tilted them. We have soaked up what we can learn at the pay station viewpoint. Now we join Tim and a second ranger at the south end of the recreation area. Ranger James Larson came to Wild Rivers in 2023 after graduating from the Environmental Education and Interpretation Program at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. You will hear his love and talent for educating visitors in this podcast. Although he has accepted a two-year assignment with the Peace Corps teaching English in Mongolia, I hope he finds his way back to park interpretation one day. James led off our day together at the park's best-known overlook, two miles south of the visitor center. We should probably set the scene for our listeners here, but we're standing right at the La Junta point, south end of Wild Rivers, and we're looking at basically a big hole in the ground that's 800 feet deep and about three-quarters of a mile wide. This is the uh, widest and deepest portion of the Rio Grande Gorge in the whole monument. Um, so this is a really special and magnificent place. It's really a world of extremes out here. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's the plateau, which covers uh, much of Taos uh -huh. and like the surrounding areas, which is virtually just completely flat. And then mm. there's the gorge, which suddenly drops 800 feet. Yeah. You know, you'll walk right up to it. Don't even realize you're there yeah. until you're looking straight down. Yeah. And then there's this these the southern end of the rocky mountains mm -hmm. range coming, coming through right. here yeah. with uh the wheeler peak we were talking about is the tallest mountain in new mexico you can see both the red river and rio grande meet here mm -hmm. and you can even from this far away you can hear the rivers raging mm. that's why they call this place wild rivers but there's lots of trees down there ponderosa pine and pinion pine and douglas fir douglas fir and juniper mm -hmm. uh we often see big horns uh down there and they've been on the La Junta trail here what's a bighorn a uh, rocky sheep. mountain bighorn sheep yeah uh they're pretty common out here if you come and visit wild rivers mm -hmm. i'd say there's a 50 50 chance you see one on your visit which increases depending on how long you're camping here I'm, i wanted to bring up uh what i think of as an interesting phenomena here 
in the gorge itself, which is, if you look down here, you can see the tall pines down lower. Uh -huh. We don't have the tall pines on the, on the rim here. Yeah. All right. So it's like, why are they down there? You know, because in the West, because of the elevation gain, as you get higher, you get more moisture because of the way the clouds come in. Uh -huh. They'll tend to drop rain and more rain and snow on the peaks yeah. or in the mountain ranges rather than in the flat areas. Uh -huh. So because of the moisture coming off of the river, mm -hmm. it tricks these ponderosa pines into thinking that that moisture is the same as what you know it is it's the same moisture that's right. at the higher elevations okay. you know so we've got this these so big actually, pines growing so down the there pines growing right in the in the yeah. valley of the red river there it looks so, like some big tall ponderosa pines i can see from here uh, then we call it an inverted ecosystem okay because it's like an inversion happening from Instead of being up, you know, above 8,000 feet, which is like where the ponderosas usually like to grow, uh -huh. they're down at like, uh, you know, seven, six. It's still within their natural habitat, okay. but uh -huh. they wouldn't yeah. be down yeah. there. Because you look up here, and all you see is the pinon juniper kind yeah. of forest on the rim. And I'm wondering, they're growing really well along the stream and also along the bank, and I wondered if there's something to do also with the fact that I think when we go to little arsenic and big arsenic, we're going to find that there's water that falls on top of the plateau is is coming out at sort of mid-level and i'm wondering if some of the and maybe there's groundwater that's helping the definitely ponderosas along the slope there De definitely groundwater yeah. Yeah. yeah the watershed from the wheeler peak area created the red river which was the original headwaters of uh -huh. the rio grande until this event occurred which was that the watershed from the mountain ranges in southern Colorado were collecting in Lake Alamosa, which was, as far as we could tell, 50 miles wide, 100 miles long. Just past that dome up there is the Ute Mountain, okay? There's a series of hills that they call the San Luis Hills, which are on BLM land. They created a dam that held all of that Lake Alamosa back in place. That gave way 400,000 years, which started the initial flow through here to make the Rio Grande headwaters be farther north than the, than the Red River. And then when that event occurred up in the San Luis Hills mm -hmm. that broke through, there must have been just a massive amount of water flow that came through there that really created this gorge that we're seeing here. Okay. You know? okay. I mean, to cut through basalt like that. And, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At La Junta Point, the rangers and I compared the view with a map I had enlarged from a 2019 research paper. The work by Travis Clough and others adds to the picture of how the gorge evolved after the Lake Alamosa spillover opened up flow from a much bigger area. Dr. Clough talked to Rock on Mother Earth about how that flow supercharged two alternating stream processes. These words incision and aggradation may sound unfamiliar. But if you enjoy the mixed blessing of living next to a creek or river, you may recognize the processes. Incision sounds like surgery, but high water won't have surgical precision if it incises a channel across your yard. Then there's the aggravation of aggradation. Overnight, a flood leaves behind mud or gravel, aggrading a low spot for which you had other plans. A gorge like we see here that's like 240 meters deep, that was created by the river. In this case, with the confluence of the Red River and the Rio Grande River. Essentially, there is a, um, a balance between stream power, so how much water is flowing through these river systems, and sediment flux, so the amount of sediment that's in the system. And one could imagine that when you don't have a lot of stream power, and all things else being equal, you have a lot of sediment, that things can aggrade so that the base of the river level can rise up. And on the flip side of that, when you have a lot of stream power, perhaps after uh, a melting event from recent glaciation, you then down cut and then incise into what is now this gorge. So you can imagine that, um, let's say about 400,000 years ago, there was no gorge. It was a river that you would imagine or a creek that you could find in your neighborhood. We postulate that after the overflow of, of Lake Alamosa um, near Alamosa, Colorado, at about 440,000 years ago, that's when we start to see a through-going river um, that can uh, incise through bedrock and alluvium to lead to what we see today. 
Yeah. When we first visited Rio Grande del Norte and the Wild Rivers Recreation Area and looking out into this gorge, we were struck by these flat-topped surfaces that are uh, deeper down in the gorge. We, at the time, weren't sure if they were terraces or maybe backfills of landslide deposits. If I read your work correctly, you found both terraces deeper in the gorge and backfills of landslide deposits higher up. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you a bit later about the landslides you wrote about. I'm interested in both the talus piles and those weird features called Tariva blocks, but I think your main research focus was the terraces. Can you tell our listeners what a terrace is? In this environment, the terrace is really an ancient floodplain, a flat surface of fill that was, that was sourced from, from upriver, basically a, a snapshot in time of what the floodplain looked like before uh, river incision progressed to create the landscape that we see today. These terraces, you can imagine this, right? You, you Let's start with a river where there's not a gorge, right? It's something that you could imagine, um, you know, in your neighborhood or at a park, right? If you uh, have a, a new river, right, that's actively uh, flowing um, and you uh, have a situation where through stream power or through tools, through twigs, rocks, things like that, you start incising that river. If that situation and those conditions stayed the, the same way, throughout time, you would just have a straight cutting down river, right? There's portions of the Grand Canyon, for example, where there's been insane amounts of incision, but you're not seeing any terraces, really. You just see a straight, um, almost straight up and down cliff, right? But clearly in Rio Grande del Norte National Monument in this area um, that we're looking out on here, uh, that is not the case, right? We have a very wide gorge. So as that river began to incise, it wasn't just fully incising all the way down to the you know 240 meters um, from the cliff top as you see today, but rather there was period where there was incision, but then there was equilibrium, um, and perhaps also accumulation of sediment at the uh, base of the river as well. So when you uh, uh, have a period of equilibrium, you're going to develop a, a floodplain, um, and that floodplain, after uh, conditions change and incision begins to progress. Um, will be preserved on the landscape until it gets uh, wiped out by a later event. In this case, for what we presume to be earlier terraces closer to the rim or, or upper in elevation from the current river, uh, those were wiped out by landslides. But what we see still preserved when you walk on them, they're just nice and flat surfaces. Um, and they're also populated with large boulders that uh, we believe have been in place since their deposition um, along the levee of what is now the terrace. And so these large boulders that sit on these terraces were actually the key ingredient for us to be able to date these surfaces and come up with incision rates and what might be driving incision. When the rangers and I looked at your map, we saw that you numbered the terrace levels bottom to top from QT1 through QT6. I need to explain for listeners that the Q stands for the quaternary period, which covers the last 2.6 million years. This period is defined by repeated climate swings between ice ages and moderate temperatures, which scientists call glacial to interglacial cycles. So looking south from La Junta Point, we spotted a long terrace on the far bank, a few hundred yards past where the rivers meet. You labeled that one Quaternary Terrace 4 or QT4. Another QT4 was right below our feet between the rivers. Beside it on the other side of the Rio Grande, slightly lower in elevation, you identified a QT3. That's what we're seeing from La Junta Point looking south. And right. then if we, when we turn and look north, we're actually looking into the area where uh, I actually took the hike with the park rangers. I'm looking up the gorge. I can actually see two big mountains up on the rim in that direction I see. Uh, one that, that's closer, that's uh, called Cerro Chiflo, and then I see Ute Mountain back in the background. Off to the right, a straight line to that closer mountain, the middle of it, I see a couple of flat places, mm -hmm. and one of them is slightly higher than the other. And we walked on the lower of those two, the river trail that connects the trail we went down, the trail we went up. Yep. Uh, is that walks, big arsenic and little arsenic, I believe? Yeah, exactly. Walks right on that QT3. Now I'm I'm down with uh, Ranger Larson on the Q that QT3 terrace, mm -hmm. and off to our left we can see kind of a rise, and actually if you turn to your left you see kind of these big boulders, and I think that's the edge of the slightly higher QT4 terrace. So mm -hmm. here I am with the terrace. What should I be seeing? 
Yeah. So as you're walking on this terrace surface, you're, it's probably pretty stark. Um, and as you look around, you'll notice too, these large boulders. And these are uh, serviette of basalt boulders. Those that are closest to the river, those are deposits that didn't come rolling down from the cliff next to you, but rather were very likely to be plucked uh, much further upstream and deposited on these terraces before they were abandoned. And how we know that uh, is they're sculpted and rounded in a way that implies a long travel distance. Um, you could imagine that if something didn't travel very far and it's a very hard substance, it's a basalt in this case, that it might be jagged, it might be blocky, it might exhibit features that it just kind of fell, right? Um, very similar to what you'd see when you're on top of the, the rim of the gorge, you see this columnar uh, jointed basalt that um, uh, certainly isn't smooth to the touch. However, these boulders on these terraces are smooth to the touch. In many instances, for some of the larger boulders or even cobbles, you can flip them over and see fluting and casting from, from deposits uh, uh, along its way. You uh, can notice indeed that they do not look fresh. And those deposits themselves were were the key for us, right? Our work in this area wasn't just um, identifying whether or not there was terraces or landslide deposits, um, but we wanted to piece together a sequence of time of what led to what we're seeing. So when we went and sampled um, the boulders that were uh, uh, put in place at these terraces to get at an age for these terraces, we then compared them to periods of glacial and interglacial cycles. When you go from a period of glaciation, so you can imagine the Rockies being um, outfitted with glaciers at high elevation, the San Juan Mountains were glaciated in the past at multiple times. Once those glaciers began to melt, that brought a lot more stream power to the system, and that brought a large punctuated wave of incision. At least that's what we, um, what we postulate is what has happened in this particular area. And what we found is that many of these terraces have an age that corresponds with the transition between glacial and interglacial conditions. That gives us uh, some evidence to say, hey, it's likely that what is driving incision, at least over the last um, you know, 60,000 years or so here, uh, might have something to do with these glacial and interglacial changes. And this is something that doesn't happen overnight, right? This is going to happen over hundreds to thousands of years. But nonetheless, what that has led to is the abandonment of these surfaces that, that are known as terraces. For the rest of the podcast, we'll take a hike into the gorge. Less than half a mile down the Big Arsenic Trail, 300 feet below the canyon rim, we'll see where a staggering geologic feature cradles a sweet-smelling grove of ponderosa pine. Dropping 400 more feet, we reach the river, past Big Arsenic Spring, and continue to a terrace that Ranger Larson calls better than an art museum. That's the end of the podcast, one mile from the Big Arsenic Trailhead. If you make this hike, you can simply retrace all the way back to the Big Arsenic Trailhead. Or, as James Larson and I did that day, you can branch off about halfway up onto the river trail. We drop back down to a place 800 feet below the rim, close to where river rafters brave thundering rapids in spring. We climbed a little bit to the QT3 terrace that you heard Dr. Clow and me discuss. Then we climbed a lot more up the Little Arsenic Trail with spectacular views. James and I emerged at Little Arsenic Campground, me feeling the altitude and my age, but very satisfied with our five-hour, nearly five-mile hike. So let's start down the Big Arsenic Trail. The rangers explained that the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s built the walls and switchbacks that guide the trail through the upper Serviette of Basalt. Before the first switchback, there's a viewpoint with the sign Rio Grande Gorge, inverted ecosystem. From here, above the gorge rim, check, check. From here, above the gorge rim, you can see several features that we discussed at the pay station overlook. Cerro Montoso across the river, and siding up the gorge is Cerro de la Hoya, aka Pot Mountain. Look closely in front of Pot Mountain to the left of its summit, to see the two small bumps that are remnants of the pre-rift volcanics of 25 million years ago, timber and brushy mountains. There is no lower serviette of basalt to cross on this trail. Instead, the switchbacks lower you through a tailless pile of jagged boulders, many as big as you are. When I talked to Travis Clough, he contrasted the history of these rocks with the rounded boulders on terraces. 
So we're seeing talus piles. So talus is it's like a mass of rock fragments at the foot of a cliff. And these are distinct from those rounded, sculpted, serrated basalt boulders that we see at the edge of the terraces that were sourced from upstream. These were sourced instead um, from very nearby, from, from the cliff, and have been ongoing throughout time, right? Uh, landsliding has occurred largely because this basalt, like much basalt, is columnar jointed. So when you're actually on the gorge rim, you can see this columnar joining quite well. And one could imagine that uh, much further into the future that where you're standing on at that rim might not be there anymore. There might be more landsliding that occurs. I'm guessing that in summer, this basalt will radiate heat about as well as the lava rocks in a sauna. So it will be a relief to reach the shady spot in front of a sign about Ponderosa Pine. Here, Ranger Larson spoke up. It's real sweet smelling. You know, we want to utilize as many senses as possible yeah. in interpretation. And, you know, very rarely can you use smell. But uh, uh, Ponderosa Pines give a good opportunity to mm -hmm. go right up and it smells really sweet. This is one of the terrace-like areas that Clow and others determined to be not a terrace, but backfill behind a landslide deposit. Weirdly, the deposit in question is a nearly intact strip of basalt parallel to the cliffs, twice as long as a football field, and at least 25 feet wide. It lies to the left of the trail and tilts toward the trail at about 30 degrees. It seems to cradle the soil and water that allows the ponderosa pine habitat. I asked Dr. Clow about this enormous strip of tilted basalt. These large blocks are, are like staggering. They're very uh, obvious features in the landscape. And one thing that we battled with initially was, well, is this related to, to terrace development? Because you end up seeing these flat surfaces next to these large blocks. These large landslide blocks are actually known as Tariva blocks. Um, they were first observed in like the 30s in Tariva, Arizona. And what these are are basically large chunks, in this case of serviette basalt, that have, have there was a landslide that occurred on what, what's known as a listric surface, a, a curved slip surface that has led to the back tilting of these blocks. Did this, now, would this be something that happened like one day it's up on the cliff and the next day it's down where it is now? Or? I wouldn't say that it happened over the course of a day, right? But one thing that we do know is that that all occurred um, before the development of the terraces, most likely somewhere between 150 and, and you know, 400,000 years ago. And I can only speculate on how quick that event would have happened, but I, I don't think it would have happened overnight. Why do you say that they're not? something that could have happened since your terraces. You can project the landslide listric slip surface and see that that gets truncated by the terraces. Those terraces had to have formed after this large scale landsliding. Otherwise, they would have been displaced themselves um, along this listric slip surface. Have you seen the Tariva block by the Ponderosa Pine sign? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful feature. It's extremely easy to access. You can walk up to the edge of the block. You can you can stand on it and feel that it's tilted. And you can look down at your feet and see the intact nature of that serviette of basalt. You can see the columnar jointing. You can see the angularity of the edge. And in fact, if you walk a little bit past the, the ponderosa pine sign and, and circle back before that next switchback, if I'm not mistaken, you can go to the base of what's exposed of that block and look up. And you're standing uh, right next to what was a large landslide that had led that to be there. And it's just, it's, it's beautiful. It's fascinating. While I was noticing and explaining the Tariva block, Sue and Dudley Chelton came up. The couple was a few months past their 50th wedding anniversary. Dudley is an oceanography professor who Sue wanted us to know was elected the previous year to the National Academy of Sciences. They were aglow from visiting the river's edge. So you guys decided to hike down to the bottom, and what did you see? Oh, it is, oh God, I, it's it amazing. Is so I mean, these are ponderosa pines down there, right? right. Yep. I, I mean, from the top, I looked down and I saw these big tall trees, and I said, geez, those look like ponderosas. First, I thought they were telephone poles. I thought, I have a telephone line running up this. <laughs> but then we got down to the bottom of little uh, Arsenic Spring Trail, and it's like, those are ponderosa pines, you know? Yes. They got to have a lot of water. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, we were talking about that. We we coined the phrase an in, inverted ecosystem. So, yeah. you know, they yeah. like tricked into thinking that 
I there's plenty shot. of moisture down here right. rather than up in you know the right. uh, eight thousand feet. Right. You know, so they just grow down here. Yeah. Right? Anyway, I seeds get saw. deposited from birds and other wildlife. You know, and yeah. wind. You know, I've so heard a lot of birds. Yeah. The, the river. The river, it's walking along the river, so, is just And gorgeous. the rocks, all the rocks. Uh, yeah. And, just... the, uh, and the color of the river, I was like, I, I mean, I didn't expect What it. color is the river? Kind of a greenish, yeah. Yeah. greenish blue. I'm sure that it's sediments uh, that are in it, you know, but they're not the usual red or brown sediments that I'm familiar with. Uh, 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 it's some sort of a volcanic sediment that's more of a gray. See but it's just so pretty, uh, the boulders. I mean, it must be incredible here in the springtime or early summer when the snow melt and the river's roaring. Oh, it's raging, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so just as a, you know, it's, uh, we measure it with cubic feet per second, you know, CFS. And right now it's running at about 55 CFS. In the spring, it was like over 2,000. You know? so, <laughs> oh my gosh. So it's up to about here, right? <laughs> wow. wow. And I suppose, was this a, a bigger year than normal? Or? It was, we had a wet spring, so yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. a dry summer. You know, well, so. it rained all summer long in Colorado, but nothing here, right? Yeah. <laughs> People Not are complaining here. about yeah. that. Yeah. So this yeah, is your you first time down here. It is. Oh, yeah. you're oh, gonna love it. Oh, it's so it. amazing. Um, uh, it's just an incredible ecosystem yeah. all along there. Uh, uh. As I neared this oasis-like world after rounding the first switchback past the junction with the river trail, my back was to a notable geological view. Only on the way back up did I notice the pink sediment layers between the upper and lower Servietta basalt. These are the same sediment layers, usually hidden under talus that I mentioned seeing from the pay station overlook. The sediments belong to the Santa Fe group, similar in age and origin to the pink rock layers you see in road cuts just north of Santa Fe. As Ranger Long described with his rift model, these are sediments that have been filling the rift valley. They were eroded from the adjacent rising mountains. Ranger Long had returned to his visitor center duties by the time James and I reached the Rio Grande. Later, after I was home, I got him to talk about the different world at the bottom of the gorge. Agua es vida, here as the water is life. It is why we can be here as humans. Are you in Georgia right now? I am. Much different here than, uh, than there. <laughs> we probably get, you know, 12 inches of rain a year. A moisture, I should say. Sometimes it's 13 inches. You know, wow, we got a really big one going that year. <laughs> the plant life really enjoys the water. Our ancestral uh, first peoples have been using the, the, the Rio Grande area for hunting, fishing, settlements even. And we have record of that through rock art all throughout the canyon. Upstream along the Rio Grande, just past the turnoff to a picnic shelter, stepping stones take you across a clear brook. This is the outflow of Big Arsenic Spring. The name is assumed to be reverse marketing by an early settler who did not want company. The water, both here and at Little Arsenic, is arsenic-free and safe if filtered or treated like any backcountry spring. The actual spring is somewhere upslope where the groundwater of the Taos Plateau comes out of fractures and bedrock. It is concealed under the talus that you can see from the stepping stones. The huge rock partway upslope is another Tariva block. James coaxed me onward to see some rock art. Just past the springs, we walked on a flat open area that Clough and others identified as one of the youngest terraces of QT1. About 350 feet past the springs, to the left of the trail, I was photographing some petroglyphs in the shape of baby-sized footprints. Along came Christy Lowry and Jason Buckheim. They were returning from upriver, a little bewildered about not finding any springs. The 60-inch annual rainfall of their home state, known as the Sunshine State, had conditioned their search image of a spring. We're from Florida, and we heard the springs were up there. Yeah, you crossed over one of them coming in here. <laughs> it's not, not what but, we think of the springs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you, you go, people do cave diving in Florida yes. Springs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you do cave diving yourself? I do. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I gotta yeah. say, cave diving is the one hobby that, I don't know, I'll hike way down yeah. in here, but going diving underwater, yeah. you're pretty brave for that. I'll say that yeah. much. That <laughs> freaks me out a little bit. Ranger Larson persuaded Christy and Jason to retrace some of their steps to reach with us the best petroglyph area. 
A short switchback helped us mount a QT4 terrace where the trail bends sharply left. About 170 feet past the bend, a side trail between the trees leads to a sign headed, Who Passed This Way? It warns the defacing rock art is a felony. This is the area. Uh, first thing here is we suspect, we don't know for sure, but we suspect this was a spot where they ground up food because if you'll feel this, I'm sure you could probably tell me if this is natural or not. It's very smooth here. Uh-huh. Uh yeah, it definitely feels different from what's next to it, doesn't it? Now, this right here we think is um, could be a hunting blind of some kind. Just the way these rocks are organized and the view you'd have of this spot here. Would they lay down or how would the blind help versus just hiding behind a tree? Was it taller before that? <laughs> yeah. I, we suspect it was probably at least maybe up to like chest height and maybe kneeled down like this or something. So those are the first things you kind of see in when you come in here, but let me show you, this is where the really, really cool stuff is. But look on this builder right here. Oh, wow. Oh, beautiful. Oh my gosh, that's quite a, yeah. And it's all over on the top of the rock on the other side. We've got animals, we think people, including a person. It is either them giving birth or it is genitalia. It's kind of hard to say. On top, there's a lot of footprints and some abstract symbols like uh, spirals and things of that nature. You might not have gotten wildlife on the foot, but you've gotten somebody else's image of wildlife on the foot, didn't you? This is almost cooler, I think. <laughs> we walk right past this. It's easy to miss, yeah. So what do you think the meanings of these are? Well, we're not supposed to uh, try and interpret the meaning because we don't know and uh, historically it's been done very poorly in the past. The Puebloan uh, indigenous people that live around here, um, they don't uh, talk about their religion at all with outsiders because back when the Spanish first came here, there was very severe punishments for practicing you know, their indigenous religion. I mean like, you know, cutting off limbs and stuff, really horrific stuff. So um, they've just maintained complete total silence with any outsiders since then for, gosh, it's like almost 500 years, I guess. Um, but there's some like vague ideas that archeologists have on meaning. Um, they think a lot of petroglyphs were done by shaman uh, religious leaders in indigenous communities. A lot of it is petroglyphs of wildlife, uh, big horns and elk and deer. And, you know, we have bird footprints and rabbit footprints. So they think a lot of it potentially could be um, uh, related to hunting magic. There's also a lot of abstract symbols, which are a lot harder to determine what that is. Some people think it's either visions uh, shamans had when on substances like peyote or the in the inverse it would be something they look at while on peyote to have some kind of revelation again we really can't say for sure and it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between an authentic petroglyph and a a uh, imposter yeah like that one i think is recent it typically the more modern ones are of less quality because yeah, back then they were, you know, shamans doing it for like religious purpose. It was very serious. Um, whereas now people are doing it to be like, you know, oh, look, I found another petroglyph, but it's one they put themselves. There may be one of the examples, and I see a circle with a cross in it, and it looks like it was just hastily scratched into the rock. Yeah, that's the one way you can tell if it's more modern, yeah. is if it looks more like they're just scratching it versus the very meticulously peeling off the top layer of the rock. You will have noticed that we have strayed into archaeology and art history, but after all, this is rock art. I asked Dr. Cloud for geological context. After that, you will hear closing words from Ranger Larson. Um, some of these deposits, some of these large, uh, rounded and smooth boulders are the ones that actually have the, the petroglyphs on them. It's really cool and poetic that what is uh, a cultural phenomenon it also has to do with the fact of how this gorge was created and and this whole story of of incision and gorge widening and glacial and interglacial cycles all gets married together in creating deposits that led to petroglyphs that you can see when you walk, walk along this trail 
Now, also, they're covered with this black stuff. Can you talk anything about this The stuff that they meticulously, I said scratched at one time, but they meticulously mm -hmm. kind of almost picked these petroglyphs out of out of this black covering that's on these boulders. Yeah, so that black covering is a remnant of weathering that has occurred since these boulders were deposited. You could you could imagine you leave anything out for a long enough time, it degrades over time and it weathers. And how that manifests in many cases um, is a varnish, right? Um, it can happen from 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 deserts to to Arctic areas, right? But a a a varnish that coats the top of these boulders um, that also points to the fact that. They've been sitting there for quite a long time, leaving this varnish that was utilized to create these petroglyphs. They basically removed the varnish that had been built up over, in the case of the QT4 boulders, uh, based on the dating that we have, that's those have been there for roughly 30,000 years. One can imagine there's been perhaps tens of thousands of years of weathering that has led to this varnish to allow folks to create art into the varnish and, and have it stay there, which is, is truly awesome. This is even better than a museum, I think, because it's not behind a glass 5,000 miles away from where they actually drew it. They were right here doing it. It's right where they left it. In our next episode, we visit Arizona's Petrified Forest National Park. The contrast could not be greater between the tropical world of the trees and animals fossilized in the park and the modern high desert landscape. Join Rock On Mother Earth for a walk among petrified logs with a ranger, as well as fossil prep demonstrations from National Fossil Day 2023 in Episode 3, Petrified Forest, Imagine a Former World. Thanks to the Bureau of Land Management, including Supervisor Eric Valencia and Rangers Tim Long and James Larson. Thanks to the four Wild Rivers visitors named in the podcast who permitted their voices to be heard. Thanks to Dr. Paul Bauer, author of The Rio Grande, A River Guide, and Dr. Matt Zimmerer, who alerted me to the 2017 USGS Field Trip Guidebook. Thanks to Dr. Travis Clow. He invites any geoscientist interested in doing research on landslide deposits at Wild Rivers and at Rio Pueblo de Taos to reach out to him at tclow, that is T-C-L-O-W, at stanford.edu. I'm Bill Witherspoon. Remember to get the beat of the planet from her landscapes and rocks. Thanks for listening to Rock On Mother Earth. Get the beat of the planet from her landscapes and rocks. So rock on.